Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm continuing my conversations with uh, Brother Jason Jack on our series, 100 and verse, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Um, I get, maybe I'm getting a little bit punchy from all this here. I can't even pronounce it anymore. <laughs> um, so I think we've done uh, seven or eight videos now in this series. And uh, right now we're on, I think, number 36 on the list. Uh, so we're steadily making progress through this. Uh, but to those uh, viewers who have not seen uh, the prior videos, I hope you will watch this series from the beginning. Uh, not only for your benefit, if, if you need this clarified, but uh, particularly uh, if you want to send this playlist to somebody else who who really needs to hear this. Uh, with, when they see the, the that this uh, doctrine is presented so clearly, and it's repeated over and over and over and over again, hopefully that will drive the point home into their hearts. Uh, all right, brother, uh, brother Jason Jack, want to say anything before we get started? All right, uh, we are on Hebrews uh, 10.14, and I'll read it first in the KJV. It says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. All right, brother. All right, great verse, and we're continuing in Hebrews 10, the last video. We finish with Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 12. So this is really a continuation picking up from that. And just to review those three verses that we finished up with last time, in 10 through 12, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, he sat down on the right hand of God. So verse 14 continued this teaching, the one offering, obviously, being Jesus Christ's crucifixion on the cross. And through that, those who believe on him are perfected. And perfected not by making this flesh and blood perfect, but being in Christ through faith, we are perfected through Him. And that this spiritual rebirth that we have is not temporal or anything that we can lose, but it's forever, as it says. And it is current, and we see that at the end. Them that are sanctified. So it's not will be sanctified, but are sanctified. And sanctified in the sense of positionally. Again, we're looking at the spiritual man, the spiritual rebirth that is perfected in Christ through faith in him, not the flesh and blood, which will never be sanctified. We can strive to live holy lives, and we should live holy lives, and as we mature in the faith, we will become more holy so that others can see God's holiness in us so that we can be a better witness. But when it says our things abide, that doesn't mean that this flesh is perfect and that we'll never sin anymore and that we're completely holy and sanctified. It's looking at the spiritual man uh, positionally in Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, this makes me think of a, a principle that I've uh, often recommended and actually urged many people to uh, incorporate in their uh, witnessing. Um, a lot of times um, people, it seems like you have a, a Lordship Salvationist and, and uh, you or I or somebody, we're, we're trying to tell them the truth and, and correct them, but it becomes um, an ego contest of who can win an argument. And I don't think that's a very successful system. 
Um, I, I think that we're going to make a lot more progress with these people uh, by, um, well, I, I, have a, uh, I have a video titled, uh, uh, how, to, how to Checkmate a Work Salvationist in Three Moves. And, and in that, uh, there's a brother, Brother Frank, he plays the works heretic in, in the video. And um, he does a good job playing the part, even though he's he's a true believer like us. But uh, uh, he plays the part real well. But in that video, I, I, I kind of demonstrate that, wait a second, the best way to um, get the point across to uh, the lost person is, is to have them teach themselves. Uh, and that's why I like to ask someone, hey, tell me what the verse means. You know, I'm... I'm asking you to do that. Every one of these verses, um, I, I ask you to go first. Um, but it, it, in your case, it's not because you don't believe it correctly. Uh, it's just because, <laughs> because I like to hear what you have to say first. But if we employ the same um, uh, thinking and process to the, the Lordship uh, heretic, and let them go first, just present them a verse and say, look, uh, you you seem to... Be very knowledgeable. Um, maybe you can help me understand this verse. E you know, even though you and I, we really do already understand it. They're not, they're the ones that don't understand it, but we're going to ask them to explain it to us. And when we offer them verses that are so clear that could only mean one thing, uh, then they have to, as they explain it, come to the same conclusion. So they, they, rather than being a, an argument where you're, you're going to be a winner and they're going to be a loser, because um, sometimes their pride alone will never allow them to lose the argument. But if, you, if, if we present it in the way that, look, teach me what this verse means. Maybe I don't understand it correctly. And, 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 um, so, but you have a verse like this, or any of these verses in this, in this series here. Uh, if you ask someone, explain to me what this means. And uh, in this case, we could say, for by one offering. Okay, well, what, do you, what does that mean? What do you mean by one offering? And, the, the, well, they, they have to understand, I guess, that that offering is, is not a series of, of, of goats and bulls and lambs and doves and stuff that they did in uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, Judaism. But this is the one offering that actually worked, and that was Jesus Christ. In Hebrews, that's what this book's all about, saying, look, the one sacrifice that actually did the job uh, was done by Jesus, and it's, it, it was successful, and nothing else needs to be done. So it says, for by one offering, what's that talking about? Well, that's talking about Jesus' death on the cross. Well, what, is, what does it mean that when he had perfected? What, do you mean, what does it mean perfected? Well, perfected. Well, those of us who are, be are believers, we're, we're are deemed perfect in God's sight. God sees us as perfect, sinless, perfect. Uh, and how, how, well, how, but it says forever. How, how do you take that? Well, forever. I mean, how else can we understand forever? You can't debate what forever means. It means from from this point forward, forever and ever and ever, without end. So we're, we're recognized as perfect because of that one offering that Jesus did on our behalf. We are perfect forever and that are sanctified. And sanctified, we talked about in, in the last video or, or two, uh, talk, all these verses on Hebrews. That when, when it says sanctified, that means that you're, uh, you're uh, set aside as, in a group that's called holy. So when you put your faith in Jesus, brother, and I put my faith in Jesus, at that moment, we were put into this group of people uh, separated from the world as a whole. The world as a whole is lost, and we are separated into a group that's saved, uh, sanctified, or set apart, and that group is called, God calls us holy. So um, uh, I think that's the right way to uh, really win the argument without arguing with the, the, the Lordship's uh, heretics. All right, brother, I'm... I'm you want to say any more about this verse or just anything I just said? I think that's great. Yeah, especially, you know, perfected forever. And if you ask the worship salvation, you know, are you perfect? Because, you know, those who have put 
their faith in Jesus are perfected forever. That's what it says right here. That they take that as uh, continuing to live righteously and persevere to the end and not willfully sin. That that is what they're trusting in. Then they don't get this verse. And then obviously. Um, more clarification would be needed and, and going through it with them. Yeah. Now, this word sanctified, I'm looking at the uh, Amplified Translation, and as we've gone through this study, many times the Amplified has been helpful, and then sometimes it's a problem. Um, so by seeing the problem, we can, uh, you know, we can learn from that too. But in this case, I'm not saying this is a problem of what they're saying in the Amplified, but it's, it brings up another can of worms, I believe. They, they, they phrase it this way. For by the one offering, he, and he is capitalized. I like how they capitalize it. That's one thing in the KJV I wish they had done is use capitalization uh, because it, it, it shows deity. Uh, for, for by the one offering, he has perfected forever and completely cleansed those who are being sanctified, that is, bringing each believer to spiritual completion and maturity. Now, their insertion there, where it says, bringing each believer to spiritual completion and maturity, I like the word maturity. Uh, uh, but um, the, the term being sanctified, rather than just simply sanctified, there is a difference. And uh, I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong to th see see that to say that we are in the process of being sanctified. I used to always present sanctification as a process, um, but I, I, I now I think I'm more on the side of uh, sanctification is just like justification. It just happens in an instant and it's done. We're completely sanctified. It's not a process of being more and more sanctified. Now, if we wanted to say. Uh, spiritual growth and maturity, that's a process, and, and that's a lifelong process. And sometimes <laughs> you know, there's a saying that you're either growing or backsliding. There is no static state, you know. <laughs> so, uh, um, but hopefully over a lifetime, we gradually mature and become better Christians in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the way we're living our lives, uh, God's uh, saying, uh, well done my good and faithful servant. Uh, but my point here about the word sanctified, uh, do you think, uh, what, what do you think about my point, the differentiating between sanctification being uh, an instantaneous thing uh, or is it also an ongoing process? I think both. And the King James Paul that we read, I believe it's clearly showing that this is an instantaneous process of once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then that one offering that you're trusting in his offering for your sin, that perfects you from that perfects the spiritual man because it's a forever process. It is forever. You know, it's not a process, it's just forever, instantaneously at that moment in time that you are sanctified. I think with the amplification Amplified Bible did there is they look at the same verse but put on natural glasses and interpreted it more in a discipleship standpoint, which we should do as disciples. We should go through that process of maturity so that we can lead a quote righteous life to the best of our ability if we're guided by the spirit. But we're never going to be perfected in this flesh and blood. Um, and this mortal body is not going to last forever and it will never be completely sanctified. So I, I think it's just basically, you know, this is the bow on what this earth is saving. Uh, in Scripture, in the King James Bible, that this is the spiritual man that is talking about through faith in Jesus Christ. Whereas, I think the Amplified Bible is, is leading you to believe that a 
process and you know discipleship the process not salvation salvation is a spiritual birthday at the moment in time and it reminds me so what they did in this verse reminds me of what a lot of modern translation uh, Bibles do to particular verses and the one that just jumped, you know, out of, off the top of my head is First Corinthians one eighteen, and in the King James it says, "For preaching of the cross is for them that perish foolishness, but so that we are saved, it is the power of God." Now, if you look at that in another modern translation, it will change it to "is perishing and is being saved." You know, being saved like it's a process. Um, but the King James, the Word of God, gets it correct. It's are saved, and I think the the same applies here in Hebrews ten fourteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's another. Um... I hate to say can of worms like it's a problem, but just opens up another area of discussion, I should say, uh, and that is the, the idea of the, the tenses of salvation, that uh, we got, we're got we saved in past tense, present tense, and future tense, uh, and that uh, uh, we have been saved. It's It was an event that happened in our, in our lives when we believed, and uh, it's done. Uh, we're being saved in that, in that uh, it, it's, it's a continuous state where it's not going to ever change and that we will be saved. And there are verses that in the Bible that state it these various ways too. So, um, and we, we will be saved um, in, in that um, it, that goes in line with the, the promise that, uh, that uh, uh, hey, uh, in the end, you know, I know you put your faith, Jesus is saying, uh, I know you put your faith in me, but don't worry. Anything that happens between now and the judgment, don't worry. You will be saved at the, at the judgment. So <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the idea of being saved uh, uh, is, is, is a valid point, even though we have already been saved. I mean, I, I don't hope I didn't. I might have even confused no, myself. Think that's a great point. We just need to realize in context that when we are being saved, it's Jesus that's doing the saving. Uh, it's not our obedience, faithfulness, our ongoing efforts that we're being saved. Yeah. Yeah. It's um... and his finished work that, that keeps us saved. You know, we rely on his faithfulness to keep us saved. Yeah, the, uh, that's another uh, point. I'm, I love these conversations uh, it, it, because you stimulate my thought. You say something and it, it sets me off and gives me uh, a whole bunch of things to, to talk about. Uh, um, it, that is, I think, the big problem is that what, what does it mean even to be saved? If to be saved, it means that somebody has to intervene to save you. There must be somebody that saved you if you, if, if you got saved. You, uh, you can't save yourself. Uh, and that icon that I have, uh, that I use for my channel is a picture of Jesus' hand reaching uh, down and uh, a person's hand reaching up, and you can recognize it's Jesus in his hand, it's nail pierced, and there, this, this reaching out. And it's a picture of uh, Jesus is reaching out. He wants to uh, grab you and pull you out of this lost state and take you to heaven. Uh, uh, the oldest requirement of you is that you reach out to him too in faith and, and trust him. And uh, so that is certainly a picture showing that, wait a second, there is an actual person that's saving you. And uh, I made a video. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, I don't know. It's one of my short 10-minute uh, videos that... Uh, uh, um, let me see. Let, not, let's stay focused on Jesus. No, it's not that one. Um, uh, but the, 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 the illustration is, is the same kind of illustration. If you're in water and it's over your head, 
and you're trying to go up this steep slope, but you slip back and there's no way for you to you know that eventually you're going to give out and sink into death. Uh, and yet, if someone reaches out their hand to grab you and pull you out from this hopeless situation you're in, you would have to say that that person saved you. They are your savior. And uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's, it's that simple. It's, it's so simple, a little child should be able to relate to this, but people want to complicate it. Just the idea that, is Jesus your savior? Did, did, did you get saved? I mean, these, the, just the concept of the word should settle the whole thing about lordship and works and anything else. No, it, it boils down to, is he your savior? <laughs> you know? All right. Uh, anything else? I'll, I'll go to the next verse, here, unless you want to talk more. Okay. Yeah, just down a couple. Okay. Uh, the, the next one, we're, uh, I'm finding it very interesting how we, we're so many verses in Hebrews. I've said this over and over, but my favorite books are John, Galatians, and Hebrews. And a lot of people are afraid of Hebrews and because of a couple of problem verses that they don't understand. But uh, there are so much salvation and eternal security and deity of Christ verses. I mean, the thing, the three core doctrines of Christ's unity, Jesus is God, uh, the uh, salvation's uh, faith alone, and eternal security. And... Um, uh, that's really, we find so many verses we can go to in Hebrews to make that point. This one is Hebrews 10, 17, and 18. Uh, in the KJV, it says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Okay, brother. First verse, uh, seven, 17, uh, this is one I've used many times in my preaching, uh, uh, I, I, kind of a, a companion verse that I, that I used with it is, uh, uh, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. 
and, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Uh, to just drive home this point, and then and God wants us to this point to really be driven home and to be really um, make it so clear that we can rest and be assured and have joy and peace because of this we're assured that look your sins and iniquities God will remember no more now God God is on mission so God does remember everything but he doesn't remember him in the sense that he's going to ever hold them against you you know uh, it's not like God has uh, got old and now his memory failed him or something <laughs> he can't remember you know he won't remember them in the sense that he, I'm not going to ever hold that against you it's like you never did it don't worry about it uh, that, that's, it's a don't worry verse you don't need to worry uh, that's another verse too that to me when Jesus talked about worry uh, in the gospel account when he's uh, teaching us about why we shouldn't worry and um, I've often felt that um, I have a weakness where I sometimes I tend to worry not about salvation <laughs> that's, a, that's the only thing I don't worry about I guess <laughs> but, but other things in life I'm always afraid like my wife took a trip this weekend um, uh, with my sister to go uh, to California and I'm worried uh, and and uh, every time my son goes away, I, I always worry. And my constant prayer is for their s safety and, and health. I'm just so afraid something's going to happen. And and what it really is, worry is uh, opposite of faith. If you have faith, you don't worry. And, and worry means you don't have faith. As a matter of fact, I think even the verse, I think it's in Matthew where this is discussed, but um, um, I think it even says that... Uh, compares worrying to having no faith uh, but this is a don't worry verse here God's saying look your sins and equities I'm not going to ever even remember it it's forgotten it's don't don't worry about that he wants us to have this peace um, and that one I'll cast your sins as far as the east is from the west uh, how far is the east from the west well I guess they go off into you know, in eternity into, is there a word for an endless distance? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's how far away he's cast them away. So these things should give us this confidence that, hey, I don't need to worry about my, my salvation. Um, well, I want to talk about 18, but first let me get back to you and see if you have any more thoughts on 17. Yeah. 
you had a comment on that one. Yeah. Well, um, a little bit more on this. Uh, you mentioned the cross, and uh, I'm I'm going to back off just so my camera can see me. Um, um, my whole body here. I want to just get in a cross position here. I'm going to talk louder so the microphone will pick it up. But if, if you can picture, this is Jesus on the cross with his arms outstretched. This is a picture people often I've heard say, see when Jesus spreads his arm like that, he's saying, I love you this much, that much, like his arms are spread out across like that. And, um, I think that's a good picture of his, his love. Yeah, but it's also a picture of, I, I think, of the sins. You know, a, a picture of, hey, I've cast your sins as far as the east and the west. Like he's casting the sins off, and your arms are outstretched. He's throwing your sins away. Um, uh, the um, there was something else you said that made me. Th I wanted to say something, but I can't remember. Uh, all right, let's go to eighteen then. If um. um Unless that thought comes back to me. Sometimes the thought does return as soon as I stop trying to think about it. <laughs> uh, okay, so 18 says, Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Uh, now, uh, what do you believe re remission is, brother? How would, how would you define the word remission? Well, uh, the reason I'm even bringing this up is because I've actually heard, you know, I, I, I like to listen to the other point of view. So if I teach against something, I guarantee you, I've studied it. I've studied their side because I'm not going to go preaching against it unless I know what they, what they believe and teach. And when I see this word remission, I think of some of these Paul onlyists that I've heard actually teaching that remission does not mean forgiveness. And they, they, and they, they liken it to cancer. Uh, you, you're, if your cancer goes into a remission, it doesn't mean you're cured from cancer. It just means that it, it's in a state of remission. But it could, it could come back. Uh, it's not, you know, the problem is not necessarily over. Uh, and I don't like that. Uh, I, I, I think that um, maybe the KJV choosing to use the word remission, I, I don't know, to them, what they were thinking about the word remission. I don't know if we had the concept of cancer going into remission in those days or not to confuse the issue. But to me, remission, uh, this is how it is in the Amplified. It says, now where there is absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation of the penalty of these things. So there's no confusion there. Uh, uh, you know, it's not, you don't need to worry, it's just in a state of remission and those sins may come back to haunt you, you know. No, it's, it's absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation. So, uh, uh, that, that to me, uh, when I bring up these things, sometimes I bring up things that may be not that relevant. A lot of people may not be aware of these things, but I'm talking to those people who are teaching these things that remission of, of the sin is not forgiveness of sin. And I, 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 I just hate when they, they do something like that. Uh, the, the final part of that verse is, there is no more offering for sin. So in other words, that uh, if the sin is completely canceled out and done, uh, there is no longer an offering to, that could possibly do anything because it's already been washed away completely. It's gone. The Amplified on that portion says, there is no longer any offering to be made to atone for sin. Uh, not only is it not necessary, but it doesn't, it can't accomplish anything because it's already been accomplished by Jesus. All right. Anything more on 18? I like, I like that verse in the sense in 18, there's no more offering for sin. And just really thinking about that in the sense that I know some people, and I thought this when I was growing up in a worship salvation church. And this is the reason that I know, like you said, you know the other side of the argument. I know this mindset so well because I grew up in, in the church like that, that taught this 
backdoor work based salvation. And, you know, they will give you lip service and say, oh, yeah, it's my grade for faith. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, if you sin willfully or if you fall back in sin, then you have to repent of your sin. And, you know, for a while, when I was young as a teenager, confused and, you know, just blinded by this worship salvation mindset, I thought that if I committed a really bad sin, I had to get down on my knees and ask for forgiveness of that sin, or I was in jeopardy of losing my salvation. And that's how a lot of people think, that if they fall into sin, that they have to ask for forgiveness and repent and confess to get back in good standing for salvation. But if you look at this first 10 18, there's no more offering for sin. So getting down on your hands and knees and confessing and praying that you're going to stop doing whatever you did, that offering doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. Because there's only one offering that matters, and that's Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for you. So I just want to bring that to attention that, you know, we should, um, you know, confess and, and try to turn from sin as a disciple. But that has no bearing on our salvation because there's only one offering for sin, and it's not our prayers or our guilty conscience that comes about and our actions to change the wrongs into right that has any bearing on that. It's Jesus offering for sin once and for all. Mm-hmm. All right. uh, want to go to the next verse now? Yeah, I'll uh, go to the second phrase here. One. One nine, 2 Corinthians one nine. He says, uh, "But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead." And the next number on our list is the next verse that we want to do these together. Okay. Let me do that then. I'll include that here. Okay. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Okay, brother. Verse 9 clearly shows that the sentence that we have of death is because of sin in ourselves, in our flesh. Um, you know, for as Romans 5.12, you know, brings to mind, um, you know, out of sin, the death by sin, for our sin. So we have that sentence of death upon us, and we can't do anything about it on our own. Uh, so we should trust in ourselves to try to accomplish to get remission of the death sentence. Um, we have to remember who raises and has raised the dead, and that's God, um, who raised Jesus Christ, and that is the sacrifice for our sin that um, overcomes death for us. It overcomes that sentence. And verse 10 continues to discuss Jesus in a sense, as our deliverer. And, you know, we're mentioning, you know, our saved versus our being saved. Well, in God's eyes, he knows the end from the beginning, and he is the Alpha and Omega, and no beginning and no end. He's eternal. And this shows that very well, this past, present, future tense of Jesus, what he did for us. Uh, he delivered us from so great a death. He does deliver. He does 
deliver and whom we trust in Jesus, and that he will yet deliver us. And so it has that past, present, and future tense uh, to verse 10, showing basically that he is eternal, uh, that we can rest in his promise, um, which he gave from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God, to overcome death for us. And, you know, that's the way it's always been since the beginning. He's always, um, God has always had a plan to deliver us. He's always been our redeemer, our deliverer. Um, and, and we see this at the beginning of Second Corinthians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the beginning of nine, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Um, we've talked about this in some of our earlier uh, uh, discussions um, that about uh, the uh, the fall of man and what happened, and and it was actually a change in our DNA. Um, it was basically um, there was a. a a genetic defect that's passed on from generation to generation. We all have it now, and that's mortality. Uh, because of Adam and Eve's fall, they uh, died that day spiritually, and their body began to die. It took 900 years, but it began this process, uh, and uh, all their offspring, they uh, were born uh, spiritually dead, uh, they had a living soul and mind and, and, and body, but the spirit was was dead. It's uh, disconnected from the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that's what this verse here is really referring to. But we had the sentence of death. In other words, every person when they're born, they're already under a death sentence. And uh, so uh, the, but the, even though we're under that death sentence, the, the genetic effect cannot be changed in this body. But we get a new body eventually uh, after the uh, at the resurrection of all the believers. We get a glorified body that doesn't have that defect, and we never have to get sick or die. Or uh, it says there will be no death or sorrow or crying or tears. And, uh, it's a wonderful thing to look forward to. But until then. We have this uh, sentence of death in us, in our DNA. And and it says that we should not trust in ourselves. And that's really what this oil boils down to. Salvation is a question of, uh, will you trust in yourself or are you going to trust in God? Who who actually raises the dead? (laughs) You know, do you have the power to raise the dead? Well, I wouldn't trust myself if I can't raise the dead, but I know that Jesus can and does. You know, he raised himself from the dead as a sign to prove that he is who he claimed to be and he does have the power of life and death. And that uh, that reason alone, we can have confidence. Uh, we, our faith is justified. Uh, uh, so um, it's just a question of this is the choice everybody has. Trust in yourselves. Think that you don't need Jesus or that Jesus can do his part, but it's not good enough, and you've got to do yourself, do your part, and get sin out of your life, and, and uh, you know, uh, pick up your cross, and work really hard at it. And, uh, or you can just trust God, who has the power to raise the dead. Uh, before I go to verse 10, any more thoughts on 9? Okay, so then he says, who del- uh, that's what I thought when we first read the verses, those, these tenses that, that uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, and I was happy to see that you immediately saw that. Uh, so you have, who delivered us from so great a death. So it's been done, that's past. That, that's, uh, uh, basically it's passed in two ways. He delivered us at the cross. So, uh, uh, that's when his work was finished to, to, so that we could have this gift of, of life everlasting. But it also uh, delivered us at the moment we embraced him. 
Oh, by the way, that video that I was trying to remember the name of earlier is, is titled uh, Reach and Embrace Jesus. Uh, it's only 10 minutes long, but it's, the concept is Jesus is reaching out to you. You, you know, just take his hand and he'll take you to heaven. It's that simple. And uh, uh, let him be the Savior and Savior and, and uh, rely on him. But so when you put your faith in Jesus, brother, so many years ago, you were delivered from death at that time. That's done. That's past tense. And he says, and doth deliver. That means it does deliver. It's still delivering you. and still continue to keep you in this state. And in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So uh, it, 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 there's going to be another come point in the future uh, where there's uh, your death. And then you get a resurrection. And you're, you're raised to life uh, everlasting you know, with a glorified body. And uh, uh, that's the promise. Now, in the Amplified, I'll read the whole thing in the Amplified. Indeed, we felt within ourselves that we had received the sentence of death and were convinced that we would die. But this happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He rescued us from so great a threat of death and will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope, and he will again rescue us from the danger and from drain um, from danger and draw us near. I don't know from danger and draw us near. I I don't know how that I could how they came up with that. I mean it's it's an interesting thought, but I don't know where they got that related to the verse though. Do you? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Um, any more to be said on, on verse 10? Can I just summarize in 9 and 10 together? You see the word trust in both verses. In verse 9, it's in the context of not trusting in ourselves. It's not what we do. But rather in verse 10, that we're trusting in Jesus Christ, what he did for deliverance. We can't deliver ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We, we trust in what he did. He paid for our sins. We're trusting in what he will do. He promises to raise us to life everlasting. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, the next one uh, is Ephesians 1, 12 and 13. Okay. Uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. Uh, after that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. that I share with others on the gospel and eternal security. It's all summarized right there um, in early 14 really adds to the eternal security in Christ. Um, but if you go back to verse 12, first of all, it's not praising in our actions or our work and glorifying in that, but it's the praise of his glory. And it shows this word trust, just like we saw in the last passage. It's not trusting in ourselves. It's trusting in Jesus Christ. It's trusting in what he did. And then it goes into verse 13, and it really sort of, sort of shows the heart of a believer and, the, and the, the way that a believer goes from hearing the gospel to receiving salvation that it all starts with trust. Trusting that God is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek to seek him. So you're searching for God. You are looking for the one true God. And God put somebody on the Bible or a missionary or some, whatever in your path to give you the good news. 
uh, and we talked about that a little bit in Acts 10 uh, with Cornelius. You know, Cornelius was doing the right thing, so he wasn't a failure until he heard the gospel of good faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but it does talk about that in the Bible, that those that are seeking God, that, that see the, the moral goodness of the law and are trying to lead a, quote, good life or righteous life, God will put people in those person's pathway to present the gospel. And then once that occurs, they hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of eternal life, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day to overcome death for us. And we trust that. We hear the gospel, and then we trust the gospel and believe it. Once we do that, that puts this spiritual, supernatural process of a rebirth where the Holy Spirit of promise seals us as a believer. And that feeling is eternal as it goes on in verse 14, which is the earnest discussing the Holy Spirit describes the Holy Spirit as the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So again, if we want to add verse 14 to the passage that they have in this uh, list, we see the praise of his glory to start this process and it ends with the praise of his glory. It's all what he did, not what we do. And we're, and I think another thing to understand in verse 14 is we're we're a purchased possession. You know, we didn't we didn't purchase ourselves. We're a possession of God. He purchased us unto eternal life. And you know, just like something that we purchase, that object can't unpurchase itself once we purchase it. In the same fashion, we can't lose our salvation because of something did because we didn't purchase salvation. God purchased us for salvation and eternal life through faith in Him. So this shows that person who is understanding the moral goodness of the law, the law became the schoolmaster of Christ, he trusted in God then heard the gospel unto salvation, the word of truth, believe it, believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that person was saved and is sealed and eternally secure with the Holy Spirit of promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there are, uh, there are some words and phrases that to me um, it's pretty clear cut uh, and it should not be confusing but unfortunately um, uh, the, the, the lordship uh, heretics uh, the, in order to uh, support their, their false doctrine they have to redefine even the most basic words and terms um, Believe. I, I have a video titled Believe Defined. Many, many years ago, before I was on YouTube, if you told me I would have to define what believe means, uh, I would have thought, that's crazy. Uh, but after encountering all these people, they, you know, and having a lot of people, not just one or two, but a lot of people say, well, that's right, Brother Luke, but it depends on what believe means. What does believe mean? <laughs> You know, but believe or faith, these should be obvious to everyone. But thankfully, we also have words like trust, um, confidence, uh, rely. Uh, these words, are, are, to me, are even better because um, they're, it's harder for a person to uh, uh, misrepresent what they mean. Uh, uh, if, if you if you're going to if you have to rely upon Jesus, uh, 
Well, how, can, how can you possibly misrepresent what rely upon him means? You know, depend upon him. Um, do you have, have to have confidence in him? You know, you know these things to me uh, are, uh, I'm glad that it, it's phrased in various ways uh, instead of just believe or faith. Because uh, as I said, there, there's people, that there's, there's no limit to what they're willing to do to, to uh, pervert and, and twist the scriptures. Uh, so the, these verse here says that we should be to the praise of his glory. So the only way that God gets the glory, this is one of the five solas uh, of the Reformation, uh, uh, sola gloria uh, uh, de Dios, uh, uh, and, and that is only glory for God. I mean, glory has to always go, go 100% to God. And that's why Paul tells us repeatedly, you can't boast. You have nothing to boast about. God gets all the glory. If you try to think you somehow earned it or you deserve it, then uh, you're getting glory instead of God getting all the glory. So here we have that in this verse is to be the praise of his glory, who first and then who first trusted in Christ is talking about uh, everybody who put their faith in Christ, trusted. So here we have the word trust. And that, in other words, he says that if you believe in him, you get to, he's going to give you eternal life in heaven. Will you trust him to do that? That's a, a child. I think even if we talk to someone five or six years old, we'll, we'll understand that. Uh, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Uh, of course, we could say, the good news of your salvation, uh, in whom also after that ye believed. So we have trusted and believed here used um, interchangeably. Uh, then it says ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, uh, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So um, we're talking about Right after you believe, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, sealed, uh, uh, you know, there's a, in, in Calvinism, they have this uh, concept called perseverance of the saints. Um, if they wanted to use a P word, I would say it's okay if you want to say preservation of the saints, because we're preserved. Uh, not, not, it's not based on us, our ability to persevere and keep on working hard, keep on doing works, keep our faith in, you know, strong. Uh, no, we're preserved. We're like in a jar. We're inside this jar and it's completely sealed and it's and then, and there's wax put around it. And that jar is the Holy Spirit. We're sealed in there. Uh, so. That sure is a picture of, of uh, security. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. So, so the, the Holy Spirit is like, I, I used to buy a lot of real estate. And, you know, you have a you have a purchase price. And then when you make an offer, you usually make an earnest deposit. This, I'll, I'll give you $1,000 as an earnest deposit, showing that I'm earnest, I'm sincere. And, 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 and I'm going to give you the, the balance of the deposit and I'm going to be able to get my finance and get my mortgage on it. But this is my earnest deposit. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit is God's earnest deposit to us until he gives us the whole transaction, which is the promise of a, of a resurrection and glorified body and eternal life. Um, all right, anything else on that? I think we're getting close to the end of our time, but... Any, any more thoughts on those verses? No, I mean, this is just a great passage. And I actually made a video of Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. Um, I cut out about a 10-minute um, part of Stephen Anderson, uh, one of his preachings on Ephesians 1, when he was discussing 12 through 14 and, and put it to uh, video where 
I'm showing photos and scripture at the same time he's quoting them in the sermon. And so, I, you know, um, if anybody wants to check that out, they can go to my uh, channel and look at the Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, 10 minute video on that. Is that the is that the the good uh, Stephen Anderson or the heretic Stephen Anderson? Which version is he in? Yeah, I don't believe. I don't. Uh, I don't believe that it's the heretic Stephen Anderson. Uh, but I do believe that he is a he is a brother in Christ. Albeit at times he can be very caustic, and you know he may be the stomach uh, with the pH of two sometimes of the body of Christ. Yeah. Um, but he is found on the gospel, on the deity of Christ, and on eternal security, and is an excellent teacher in most aspects of the Bible, even though I don't agree on a few of the things that he teaches. Um, you know, I've got to the point where I can sort of cast that aside and, and you know, not not really say, well, I'm not going to listen to anything he says because I don't agree on this one point. If we did that uh, in the body of Christ, we probably won't be listening to each other much at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but he does an excellent job with gospel presentation. He's a great soul winner. And I thought he did an excellent job in this 10 minutes of his sermon on Ephesians 1, 12, and 14. Mm-hmm. Or Ephesians 1, verses 12 through 14. Um, and that's why I put it to the mm-hmm. Well, I, uh, I would have guessed that uh, this portion of scripture, he would do an excellent job teaching on this. Uh, but, and, and you know me, um, apart from the, the core doctrines, um, uh, I, I believe in g- giving liberty, uh, to all, all believers on every other theological matter. Um, but where he, he puzzles me is that I've seen him to be one of the very best I've ever seen at one time and then uh, another time uh, I see him as an absolute damnable heretic I, for example, his view on, on homosexuals being reprobate and it's impossible for them to get saved uh, is one um, serious it's not just a minor thing I can tolerate and then also I actually saw him say that um, if a person uh, reads the NIV, and it could be any translation apart from the KJV, but he, just, he says the NIV. He says if someone reads the NIV and they continue reading it uh, for, let's say, you know, a year or two without changing over to the KJV, that proves that they're not, they never got saved. Because if they, if they were saved, the Holy Spirit would have, would have uh, confirmed to them that it's, uh, you know, they shouldn't be reading the NIV. So it's that kind of a statement there that is, it's, it, to me, uh, he's putting more tests on, on a person than there should be. That, that should not be a test uh, for someone's salvation. Uh, normally I don't go off on uh, uh, people unless it's, unless it's a real grievous, grievous thing like that. All right, uh, anything else uh, on the, these verses here before we finish? No, I think that was good today. Very good. Mm-hmm. All right, then. Uh, okay, we're a minute, and uh, we're four minutes over our hour. So, uh, all right, brother, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to kind of s- summarize everything, and then we'll finish.
glory goes to him that he overcame death for us and we simply rest in his finished work, his promise of eternal life. Trust in it, rely on it, and then once sealed by the Holy Spirit, be assured of it and go on to tell others about the gospel unto our salvation so that others can experience this great, wonderful uh, gift that God gives. You know, it reminds me of um, 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And we should all be very thankful uh, that we have a great and loving and mighty God. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, then. Uh... I look forward to uh, the next conversation, and we continue to make good progress. Uh, we actually, I think we discussed quite a few verses today. Um, surprise, I don't, I don't, I have to count them all up here when I'm done here, but uh, it seemed like we, we covered a lot of ground. Um, we may be up to uh, verse 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see. Uh, yeah, we're on verse 40 next time, so we're almost about 40% through. Very good. All right, brother. Uh, glad you could find a little extra time to, uh, to do this today and uh, look forward to, to our next conversation. To the viewers, uh, if you haven't done it yet, it, it's not complicated. It's not hard. Uh, all you got to do is put your faith completely in the Savior. Put no faith in yourself. Rely completely on the Savior, Jesus Christ. He's already paid for all your sins, so sin is not a barrier between you and God. Um, he raised himself from the dead to prove to us he is God and Savior, so you should have confidence in, in trusting him. Put your faith completely in him, not 50% in him and 50% in yourself. Or not like uh, Sister Renee earlier today, she's talking about 100% faith. It has to be 100%. And uh, I made a video titled uh, a couple of years ago, uh, um, I think 100% unadulterated grace. It has to be unadulterated. You can't be, uh, well, my, I have 90% or 99% in Jesus, but I, I, I'm going to hold back and put a little bit of confidence in what I do. No, it, it's like in, in Las Vegas where I live, there's a lot of gambling going on. And, and there's a term here in gambling called all in. And uh, that means you make everything you have, you're making a bet on it. Everything. You're betting it all. So you got to bet it all. you got to trust 100% on Jesus and put no confidence at all in, in your own contribution to your salvation. Do that. Trust Jesus completely, and he will completely save you. Bless you in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus Christ.